there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Attic. In this video, I'll be counting down 14 huge changes to the Jehovah's Witness religion since 2000. In other words, so far in the 21st century. So this video has been voted for by my patrons and YouTube channel members, and I'm actually really glad that they've asked me to make this video because I think it highlights very well just how much the Jehovah's Witness religion has changed in just the last few years. I'm obviously making this video in 2024. So we're coming up on a quarter of a century of the 21st century. And yeah, so many changes that we could talk about. Let's crack on through the list, shall we? We'll start with item 14. This was a big deal at the time and continues to be in a way, the scrapping of the 1935 teaching. So the 1935 teaching, for those of you who don't know, was the belief that the anointed ones who get to live in heaven after they die, that number was closed or almost sealed shut in the year 1935. So think of Jehovah's Witnesses as essentially two-tier Christianity. They have this belief that an elite get to rule as kings and priests in heaven with Jesus, but the rest, the majority of Jehovah's Witnesses live on the earth. That wasn't always the teaching. Way back in the beginning of the religion, the belief was that everyone went to heaven, which if you think about it, is pretty much the message of the Bible. But they take the number 144,000 from Revelation extremely literally, and you can understand why that would be a problem if you want to grow your religion beyond 144,000 members. And this is essentially what happened. In 1935, then Watchtower President Joseph Rutherford announced that there was this great crowd of other sheep who would be inheriting the paradise earth. And the focus of the preaching work from that point forward would be to attract these occupants of the paradise earth. And because it was 1935 when they had this new light, the understanding was, well, that must be when the anointed ones stopped being selected. But that teaching changed in 2007. I'll read you a quote from the May 1st, 2007 Watchtower, pages 30 to 31. In 1935, the great crowd of Revelation 7 verses 9 to 15 was understood to be made up of other sheep. Christians with an earthly hope who would appear on the world scene in the last days and who as a group would survive Armageddon. After that year, the thrust of the disciple-making work turned to the gathering in of the great crowd. Hence, especially after 1966, it was believed that the heavenly call ceased in 1935. However, the number of genuine anointed ones who have become unfaithful is likely not large. On the other hand, as time has gone by, some Christians baptised after 1935 have had witness borne to them that they have the heavenly hope. Thus it appears that we cannot set a specific date for when the calling of Christians to the heavenly hope ends. So in 2007 they have this new light that the year 1935 is no longer of significance in determining whether someone has a legitimate claim to be of the anointed. And that was a huge deal, because actually if you look at the number of memorial partakers, which is a statistic that gets gathered by Jehovah's Witnesses as part of their annual report, that number has jumped up significantly since 2007 because it was almost giving Jehovah's Witnesses permission to claim to be of the anointed, you know, giving them carte blanche when this 
article was produced in the 2007 Watchtower. So it was quite a big change and it has therefore made it onto my list. Moving on to change 13, I have to include the removal of Anthony Morris as governing body member, which happened, of course, on February 22nd, 2023, or at least that's when an announcement was made. Here is the announcement. It was very, very brief. On Wednesday, February 22nd, 2023, it was announced at World Headquarters that Brother Anthony Morris III is no longer serving as a member of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. And that was it. All of a sudden, one of the governing body was no longer a member of the governing body. There was no explanation given. Now, this wasn't the first time in the organization's history that a governing body member had been removed. It had happened before, but never in such a public, brutal way, because, of course, now we're in the era of JW Broadcasting, where the governing body members are positioning themselves so visibly in front of their followers and you could say, attracting such a large audience to their personalities. And in the JW Broadcasting era, you get one of these figures who's given so much prominence and so much power, suddenly have that power removed with no explanation given. And that obviously raises the question, well, what are the credentials of the other governing body members? If... A governing body member can get removed just like that. What's to stop it happening to another governing body member? And if Brother Morris did something wrong, what does that say about the process of Jehovah's spirit being on the organization? How, how can Jehovah be using this organization as his channel if there are even governing body members who are doing something wrong or something that would cause them to be removed. And how long was it going on for? So it raises all of these questions. And so that's why I think just the removal of a governing body member by itself was a very, very big change that happened very, very recently. Moving on to change number 12, Reduced magazine printing. Now, this is an interesting one. It's something that happened or started happening incrementally over a number of years. And probably nothing demonstrates it better than if I show you the bound volumes from 2005. So this is from my collection of Watchtower publications. You have here the Watchtower and Awake bound volumes for 2005. That's the, the thickness. They were printing in 2005 every month two 32-page watchtowers and two 32-page awakes. So that by the end of the year, that this is how many pages you're left with. Uh, you know, when you, you know, bind all the magazines together. As we know, that's what a bound volume is. Compare that with, this is actually, unfortunately, the most recent bound volume I have in my collection, and it's only 2020, so I have a bit of catching up to do. But this is the 2020 bound volume of Watchtowers and Awakes combined. So, I don't know whether you, you can see that properly on the camera, but Hopefully, it makes the point, doesn't it, that there was quite a lot of reduction just between 2005 and 2020. And I asked my friend Arthur to check what's the latest with <laughs> magazines, because it's hard to keep up, quite honestly. And my friend Arthur uh, does a really good job on keeping tabs on these things. The most recent change... Uh, to further reduce the number of magazines printed was in 2022 when they decided to start printing only the study editions 
of the Watchtowers on a monthly basis, and one annual public Watchtower magazine, and one annual public Awake magazine. And it was around about 2022 when they started this even more reduced level of magazine printing. And I guess when you tie in the overall reduction in printing, including with books, it's a big difference between how the organisation was in the 20th century and even into the first few years of the 21st century. I remember going to conventions as a young Jehovah's Witness and arguably the most exciting part of the convention was the literature release. And there would usually be at least two items of literature released. Usually it would be at least one book and at least one brochure. That was like the minimum. <laughs> and sometimes you'd get lucky and there would be maybe two books or three books. But there would be something like tangible that you would take home from the convention and you'd be genuinely excited. Here is a new publication and they would keep it in boxes dispersed around the venue and only after the talk was given could the boxes be opened. And it was kind of like a Jehovah's Witness version of Christmas. It's like, hey, we all get our presents. That's just not what the religion is like anymore. The, the focus has shifted completely away from printing, which you could argue makes a great deal of financial sense. I mean, we're in the digital age. It costs a lot of money and resources to print stuff. But what's happened is the organisation, rather than writing as much and doing as much research and investing as much effort into writing, they've shifted more towards just video production. And arguably, yes, you do need to do some writing <laughs> to craft videos. But nowhere near the amount of writing that the organisation used to be doing in its heyday, in its zenith, which was arguably 2005, the last year that they printed as an organisation two 32-page Watchtowers per month and two 32-page Awakes per month. Anyway, we must move on in our list, and our next item is number 11, the end of book study groups. I remember this. <laughs> so this is one of the changes that occurred while I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, it happened in 2008, and it was a huge deal at the time because a, a typical weekly routine of Jehovah's Witnesses would be that you would go to the Kingdom Hall twice, and then at one point, on one night of the week, you would meet either at the Kingdom Hall or typically in someone's home. And you would meet in a smaller group and you would go over a publication of Jehovah's Witnesses. And this would go on for maybe an hour. Um, it was extremely boring <laughs> for those of, of us who were children growing up uh, in the religion. And I remember when I ended up becoming a ministerial servant and later an elder, it became my job to conduct these book study groups. I can particularly remember conducting the book study group when we were considering the Revelation Climax book and that was a very interesting experience for me because I had so much cognitive dissonance surrounding that particular book. In my mind it, it was crazy. The, <laughs> the, the, the contents, the, the theology just didn't make any sense whatsoever and yet it was my job to guide this discussion of the contents and, you know, paragraph by paragraph, ask questions of this small group and make sure that they answered them correctly uh, or according to what was in the book. So that's what the book study arrangement was. And in 2008, they just scrapped it. Now, not too much explanation was given. They did offer some excuses about fuel costs and <laughs> wanting to 
uh, make things easier for witnesses when it comes to traveling. And they also uh, use this opportunity to say, you know, families should be studying together more. There should be more family worship. And this is uh, an excellent opportunity for family heads to make sure that their family worship is taking place on a weekly basis, that sort of thing. So there were explanations given. But in hindsight, you know, looking at this from a more cynical point of view, perhaps, just perhaps, it also had something to do with the organization realizing that by dividing up the congregation into these little units where they would be meeting in a home with only maybe one or two elders present and discussing the doctrine of the organization, there was more opportunity for there to be dissent, for people to to just say openly that they disagreed with something. And I can think of at least one example where it was actually my mother <laughs> um, spoke out at a book study group after I'd pointed something out to her in the Daniel book that, that didn't make any sense to me. And she then went on and questioned my dad about it, who was taking the book study group at the time, and said, you know, how can that make any sense? It was something to do with a particular fulfillment of Bible prophecy being a Watchtower article. <laughs> and I remember showing it to my mum and said, so, so this Bible verse was written by the prophet Daniel with it in mind that it would be fulfilled by a Watchtower article being published. You know, does that make sense to you? And she, she was like, hmm. And she kind of voiced my doubt during the book study conversation. So if that was happening just in our congregation, um, surely it was happening in other congregations too. And it can't have escaped the notice of the governing body at the time. And it wouldn't surprise me if that was the reason why they got rid of book study groups, just to make it a little bit harder for there to be these dialogues where apostasy might start to spread. So that was item number 11 in my list. Item number 10 is the overlapping generation teaching, which was brought in in 2010. I'm going to read to you from the April 15th, 2010 Watchtower, pages 10 and 11. How then are we to understand Jesus' words about this generation? He evidently, that's a favourite word of the organisation when speaking utter BS, um, he evidently meant that the lives of the anointed who were on hand when the sign began to become evident in 1914 would overlap with the lives of other anointed ones who would see the start of the Great Tribulation. That generation had a beginning and it surely will have an end. This was absolutely huge. You know, with the passage of time, we perhaps forget, and there will be many who are Jehovah's Witnesses now who weren't Jehovah's Witnesses then. Maybe they were too young to remember it, or maybe they've become Jehovah's Witnesses in more recent times. But I grew up in a religion where a key teaching was that the generation that witnessed the events of 1914 and was old enough to understand what they meant to their religion. In other words, that Jesus had begun ruling in 1914, which was the teaching. So the generation old enough to understand what was happening or have an understanding as to what was happening in 1914, that generation of anointed ones who were supposed to be going to heaven would not die off before Armageddon comes. And that puts a very finite kind of time span on when Armageddon could come. It had to happen, really, kind of by the end of the 20th century or very, very early into the 21st century, you know, due to human lifespans. <laughs> and, of course, 
as the clock was really ticking down, the organization thought, hmm, <laughs> this is not going to end well. <laughs> and they came up with this bizarre overlapping generation teaching, which David Splain actually doubled down on in 2015. Would you like an easy way to keep the generation straight? An easy way is to consider the situation of Brother Fred W. Franz. Now, you'll see that he's FWF on the chart. Now, as we said before, Brother Franz was born in 1893. He was baptized in November of 1913. So, as one of the Lord's anointed in 1914, he saw the sign and he understood what the sign meant. Now, Brother Franz lived a long life. He finished his earthly course at 99 years of age in 1992. Now, just for the sake of argument, suppose that we assume that Brother Franz was the last of that first group of anointed ones. That is, the group of anointed ones who were anointed in 1914, who saw the sign and then continued serving faithfully. Now, we're not saying Brother Franz was. We just don't know. But for the sake of argument, let's suppose. In order to be part of this generation, someone would have had to have been anointed before 1992 because he would have to have been a contemporary of some of the first group. I will never get tired of seeing David playing with that pointy stick. Wow. I can imagine in the future uh, when Armageddon happens, which obviously it won't, but David Splain riding around on his heavenly horse to execute people using that pointy stick as an instrument of execution. Uh, but yes, that's the overlapping generation teaching in a nutshell. They used, for the sake of argument, the story of F.W. Franz and said, well, look, here's someone who was of the generation and any anointed ones who were around or served with him or interacted with him kind of were overlapping and they get to also be a part of the generation. It, you know, no matter how much stick-waving <laughs> David Splain does here, it doesn't alter the fact that the word generation is singular not plural. And if Jesus wanted to give this idea of it being like a baton situation where <laughs> one generation passes it on to another, um, he could have explained that, I think, in his own words, far more clearly and without there being any need for this ridiculous diagram or this ridiculous pointy stick. But it's just so obviously silly, isn't it? Um, and it's been silly ever since 2010. They just haven't come up with anything to replace it. It's still the teaching that when Jesus said, this generation will by no means pass away, which if you think about it was a failed prophecy because he was talking to his followers at that time. He was telling his followers at that time in the context of Christianity as understood then, that the kingdom would come in in their lifetimes. And obviously Christians today come up with their own ways of trying to square the circle, but that's ultimately what Jesus was clearly saying. But to go one step further and assign modern dates to the generation and then when that particular finite length of time expires or, or is getting close to expiring, to just kind of move the goalposts and say, oh, well, it, it overlaps. <laughs> I don't need to explain to you, do I, why that's silly. So moving on to change number nine. We, of course, only had this change this year. It's the change to the disfellowshipping arrangement. Under our current arrangement, we don't say a greeting to individuals who've been removed from the congregation. However, the governing body has decided that publishers can use their Bible-trained conscience to decide whether to give a simple greeting and welcome a disfellowshipped individual who attends a congregation meeting. 
Hi. So good to see you here. Thank you. While we wouldn't have an extended conversation or socialize with such a person, we do not need to ignore him completely. So this was the now infamous 2024 governing body update number two. It went out on March 15th and it made a very, very small change in practicality to the disfellowshipping arrangement. And what it's done is it's created two-tier shunning, as I explain in the video that I produced in the immediate wake of the governing body update video. Here's a thumbnail. What it's now saying or telling Jehovah's Witnesses is that there is there are two forms of shunned. There are those who are known apostates and there are those who aren't known apostates. So yours truly <laughs> is very much considered, spoiler alert, a known apostate. And as such, no one has reached out to me, inviting me to any memorials or anything of the sort. No one's going to go anywhere near me because they're terrified, aren't they, that I might say something that will make their faith unravel. Um, but if you're not a known apostate, what this change means is that periodically your family or people from your congregation can badger you to attend the memorial and or, or attend meetings. And if you attend a meeting, they can say a brief greeting to you, but not engage in any kind of extended conversation. That's, that's the change. <laughs> you get to be invited to the Kingdom Hall, and when you're at the Kingdom Hall, rather than be treated as though you are completely a ghost, <laughs> you get to at least have your presence acknowledged when you enter the building. Nothing more. No extended conversation at all. So that's the change. I've put it quite far down on the list because it means so little in practical terms to those who have had their personal lives upended by the shunning arrangement. This juvenile control tactic where loved ones and family members are weaponized against former members and used as emotional blackmail to try and get them to return. That's essentially what the disfellowshipping arrangement is. It's completely sadistic. And this year, the governing body had an opportunity to just introduce a little bit of mercy and say, you know what, it doesn't have to be active within the family circle. You know, we don't want members of the congregation talking to just anyone who's been disfellowshipped. We need to have some kind of consequences for breaking the rules. But it doesn't have to be the case that even within a family, people can't talk to each other. They could have said that. They could have made that provision, and it would have made so much difference to so many people, some of whom are being driven to the point of absolute despair or even worse, due to this sadism. Uh, but no, they, they missed that opportunity. But it was nonetheless a change, and a change of significance in the 21st century. Moving on to number eight, pants for women and no ties for men. In certain situations, <laughs> asterisk. <laughs> so this was also announced along with the shunning changes on March 15th, 2024. Here's what Mark Sanderson had to say. The governing body has decided that sisters may choose to wear slacks when participating in the ministry and when attending Christian meetings, assemblies, and conventions. In addition, brothers may choose not to wear a tie or a jacket when participating in the ministry 
and when attending Christian meetings, assemblies, and conventions. It's actually really interesting in hindsight that Mark Sanderson just included this like on a piece of paper at the end of the update when actually this was, in my opinion at least, a more significant change than the one he'd spent the majority of the update explaining, in other words, the new rules on disfellowshipping. I mean, all of that was significant, don't get me wrong, but in terms of what it means to be a Jehovah's Witness and you know what, what worship looks and feels like, uh, the changes to dress and grooming were, I think, far more significant. Because when you go to the Kingdom Hall, you know, to have what you're wearing policed to the point where a woman isn't allowed to wear pants, um, it, it's just so messed up. And they allowed a little bit more flexibility, but it was, you know, with, again, the asterisk, terms and conditions apply. And apparently they didn't think it through quite well enough because they then needed another governing body update to address all of the questions and all of the concerns and the, you know, situations that people were dealing with as a result of this single change that they just hadn't, I mean, they, they announced it in a very clumsy way. And even by announcing it, you know, they were acknowledging how controlling and petty this religion is. I mean, really, you know, where does it say in the Bible? anything about pants or anything about ties you know ties were invented ironically by the country i'm now in croatia uh, around about the 16th or 17th century long after christianity was a thing and yet apparently ties are crucial in terms of how jehovah's witnesses present themselves even with these changes you know, you can't just turn up at a kingdom hall if you're a guy not wearing a tie in all situations. If you need to present something on the platform, you need to be wearing a tie. And they've since had to explain that if you are going to the School for Kingdom Evangelizers or the School for Pioneers, you need to wear a tie. You know, they've had to say, whoa, hold on a minute, <laughs> let's just rein this in. You know, you don't get carte blanche here. We are still insisting on ties for and women not wearing pants for all of these situations. So they've, they've done it very clumsily. But nonetheless, even as things stand, with all of the caveats that they've since had to roll out, it's still a very significant change in terms of what, again, being a Jehovah's Witness looks and feels like. And I think it's more significant than the change to shunning. Moving on to change number seven, congregation stealth tithing and mergers. Wow. Okay, so this is a whole subject in and of itself that's quite complicated to explain. And just to make this simple, I did do a video where I exhaustively summarized what the organization did here. It was a bit of a scam, in my opinion. But this was the process whereby Watchtower introduced a program of stealth tithing congregations, forcing congregations to send amounts of money to them per month irrespective of what their needs were as congregations in terms of building and maintenance. And this developed into a scheme, or a, a, they even used the word master plan, a master plan by which Kingdom Halls, rather than being built as was promised at one point, they said, oh, we're going to build loads of Kingdom Halls. That's what Stephen Lett promised. Instead, they very artfully switched. They had a, a brainwave, a premonition. They realized that what they needed to do instead of building kingdom halls was sell them. <laughs> they, 
they had so many kingdom halls and so many congregations and they figured out what if we get multiple congregations to share a single kingdom hall in more places that frees up immediately lots of real estate that we can use to make millions so it's very shady um if it's not a scam it's certainly very shady business uh, again I document it in far more detail in my Unrighteous Riches video, so please do check that out. So we move on to number six, cart witnessing. This was something that was brought in just after I stopped believing. So I was still technically one of Jehovah's Witnesses when they started using carts. It was actually uh, a prototype program that was rolled out in the New York area in 2012 and apparently it went so well that the governing body decided to give approval for it to be done in other locations. Definitely cart witnessing was a game changer and I kind of resent that it wasn't a thing when I was a believing Jehovah's Witness because when I was a believing Jehovah's Witness the only way you could do the preaching work was either going around doing the door knocking, which is what Jehovah's Witnesses are arguably most famous for, or doing return visits on people who you first met through the door knocking. So that was like the only reprieve that you had from trudging up and down the street. It was to get in your car and go to addresses addresses that you were kind of keeping notes on and, and visit people who you were keeping notes on against then their will or without their consent and, and you would have follow-up conversations or you would leave more literature more magazines that was the only way you could do the preaching work when I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses unless you were I guess in some parts of the world doing letter writing but in 2012 they changed it so that you could actually just stand on the street <laughs> next to a cart and just wait for people to come up to you and you can actually see you know when you see Jehovah's Witnesses doing this they're not getting that many people <laughs> walk up to them and in many cases they look frankly bored or they're just kind of chatting with each other but that still counts as time. They can still, if they're pioneers, we'll come to the hour reporting. If they're pioneers and they commit to doing 50 hours per month in the preaching, that's all going on the clock. Just standing next to a cart talking to your friend while people walk past. So it was revolutionary. And you can see hopefully i've argued why it's so high up on the list it was a huge deal and i resent <laughs> that it wasn't around when i was one of jehovah's witnesses or a believing jehovah's witness at least item number five the launch of jw.org i have something to show you if you'll just excuse me for a second this is one of the most rare items in my collection of Jehovah's Witness publications and memorabilia. It was given to me by an ex-Jehovah's Witness in Austin, Texas. And it completely surprised me. I wasn't expecting it, but it was when I was doing um, a book signing in Austin. And I was presented with this and... I don't know whether you can see, but on the back, if I put it a bit closer to the uh, camera, you can see there are um, little screw things so you can attach it to a wall. So this is an actual, authentic, official JW.org sign that's intended to go on the wall of a Kingdom Hall or a Jehovah's Witness place of worship. And... The JW.org website was basically revamped and launched August 27th, 2012. So it's still relatively 
recent, like 12 years ago, was when they launched the website. Prior to that, they didn't really give too much attention to their online presence, uh, the organization. They had um, watchtower.org, I think, was their main website. And then they purchased the domain jw.org and kind of had a holding page on there or something of the kind. And then, as I said, August 27th, 2012 was when this kind of new website was launched and the logo <laughs> became so prominent that it had to be on the side of all of the kingdom halls and assembly halls and Bethels and in some cases in you know very large versions of it and hopefully you can see where I'm going with this it was a bit idolatrous at least to those of us who grew up in an organization that believed very strictly in not having any images or idols or emblems of any kind. And we would criticize mainstream Christianity for using the cross as like a logo or an emblem, as a means of worship, as a means of connecting with God. And then all of a sudden you have this blue square logo that's being given so much prominence to the point where if you go to an international convention, you know, they're handing out souvenirs <laughs> with, with the JW.org logo emblazoned across them, you know? You can buy tie clips and little, you know, pin badges and all sorts of stuff. Maybe you could buy JW.org y fronts. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> the possibilities are endless, but... It's a million miles away from the religion that I grew up in to, to be giving an image so much prominence. And that, again, is a fairly recent change. And hopefully I've explained to you, hopefully I've made my argument as to why it's so high up on the list. Because the organization I was born into would not have stood for that. You know, it would not have allowed for a symbol to receive so much veneration, essentially, to the point where it's adorning souvenirs and coffee mugs and <laughs> goodness knows what. So that is point number five. Point number four, the beards you turn. Obviously, this is all still fresh in our minds, those of us who follow Jehovah's Witnesses, but here is where it was announced. Are we not grateful for this balanced direction regarding beards? Jehovah has dignified us. He allows each brother the freedom to choose whether or not he will wear a beard. Oh, thank you, Jehovah. Thank you for dignifying us in that way. <laughs> for giving us men the permission to grow out our facial hair. So... <laughs> This U-turn occurred on December 15th of last year, 2023, uh, when the governing body update number eight, hosted by, as you saw there, Stephen Lett, was released. And all of a sudden, it became possible for men to have facial hair if they were Jehovah's Witnesses. And I obviously talk more about this in the video I made at the time, thumbnail here, so I don't want to repeat myself too much. But hopefully you can understand why it's made it so high up on the list. This is massive, not just because all, all of a sudden Jehovah's Witness men had a little bit more freedom over their appearance, which they should have had anyway to begin with, but also it, it was an admission really, of just how unbiblical and controlling and uninspired the organization is. Because if it takes the Jehovah's Witness religion right up until the end of 2023, when the faithful slave apparently started being God's channel in 1919, if it, if it takes them over a hundred years to figure out that actually it's okay for men to have facial hair, what what does that say about the organization? <laughs> how, 
how can it possibly have any credible claim to being God's channel to begin with? It's just all so man-made the more you look into it and more because of the evidence that this change provides about the organization being man-made, that's why it's so high up on my list. It has made a big difference, at least to men, in, again, what worship looks and feels like. It has given them so much more freedom. But above and beyond all of those considerations is the fact that this single change, in my opinion, just flattened any concept of this being God's one true channel of communication with mankind. I mean, really, beards, you know? And they as much as admitted in this governing body update that it was never a biblical requirement to begin with. So that's point number four. And if we move on now to item number three on my list, it's the changes to reporting the preaching work. We are pleased to announce that beginning November the 1st, 2023, congregation publishers will no longer be asked to report the amount of time they spend in the ministry, nor will publishers be asked to report their placements, the videos they show, or their return visits. Instead, the field service report will simply have a box that will allow each publisher to indicate that he or she shared in any form of the ministry. So yes, this was a huge deal. Reporting time and the exact amount of time for decades has been integral to Jehovah's Witness worship. When I was a witness, there was this understanding that in order to be serving God acceptably, you needed to fill in a piece of paper at the end of every month. Again, where does it even hint at this in the Bible? You needed to fill in a piece of paper and you needed to specify how many hours of preaching you'd done in addition to a number of other statistics that were being gathered. Now, you still have to fill in the piece of paper, but you don't have to say how many hours, which is a game changer, for at least for ordinary rank and file Jehovah's Witnesses. If you happen to be a regular pioneer, someone who pledges to do 50 hours per month, you still have to report your time. And the same goes for various other specific titles that you can attain to within the Jehovah's Witness religion, such as circuit overseers and special pioneers and whatnot. But if you aren't one of those special titles, <laughs> if you're just an ordinary Jehovah's Witness who attends the Kingdom Hall, all you need to do is basically answer a yes or no question, did you preach? And it could just be five minutes. <laughs> it could just be a few words, I guess, of encouraging someone who isn't a Jehovah's Witness to become one in the space of a month, and that's enough. Even now, just explaining the rules as they are now, it's just so obvious how man-made all of this is. I mean, they're still using bits of paper and they're still insisting on this monthly cycle that's nowhere mentioned in the Bible. And the same argument that I've used earlier in this video also applies here. Why has it taken them so long to figure this out? And what about all of the decades where ordinary Jehovah's Witnesses were running around timing themselves <laughs> as to how long they spent knocking on doors. How do we account for all of that? What was God's Holy Spirit doing in that period, in that long period of many decades? You can see why it's made it so high up the list. It's an intrinsic part of Jehovah's Witness life, this, this preaching work. And as recently as last year, October 7th, at the annual meeting, to be precise, 
they just did away with it or they modified it I think to make being a Jehovah's Witness a little bit easier I, I think that's all it was about we're losing too many members how do we make it just easier to be a Jehovah's Witness you know are there, are there any rules that we're insisting on that we can just get rid of just to be a little bit more accessible to people and I think that was the thinking as I've expressed before behind other changes to beards and pants for women it's kind of a version of mainstreaming although I don't think Jehovah's Witnesses are anywhere close to being a mainstream religion. They still insist on control and they still do control people's lives in in profound and far-reaching and traumatic ways. And while they do that, they will always be a non-mainstream religion. They will always be fundamentalists, even though they reject the idea of being fundamentalists. But yeah, the change to reporting very, very high up on my list. But we now must move to point number two. And I don't have a clip to show you because this was actually new light that predated JW Broadcasting. It was announced at the October 6th, 2012 annual meeting or the 2012 annual meeting. And it was the teaching that the governing body exclusively is the faithful and discreet slave, which Jehovah's Witnesses nowadays just take for granted. But back then it was a huge deal. I was still in the process of deconverting from Jehovah's Witnesses, of, of realizing that it was all nonsense. And then I just got hit with this thing out of the blue where it was like, oh, the faithful and discreet slave, it's no longer all anointed ones on the earth. It's no longer all Jehovah's Witnesses who believe that they're going to heaven to rule as kings and priests with Jesus. That's no longer the faithful and discreet slave. Now it's just the governing body. So it was essentially a power grab. <laughs> it was the governing body getting tired of anointed ones thinking that they had any right, essentially, to have opinions on the doctrinal direction of the organization or on what the teaching should be. Because let's be honest, the faithful and discreet slave teaching prior to October 6th, 2012, was a mess. It was actually one of the things that I remember writing down when I was first, I, I first gave myself permission to put pen to paper on what my doubts were. I call it my nine grievances. I wrote down on a piece of paper nine things that didn't make any sense to me, and this was one of them. You had a governing body claiming to act as representatives of the faithful and discreet slave who were thousands of individual Jehovah's Witnesses dotted all over the earth and no apparent means by which these people could be consulted in when it came to deciding on new light or, or what the teachings of the Bible should be. It was really only the governing body who were making those decisions. So how could they in any meaningful way claim to be representatives? It didn't make any sense. And so what happened was, again, there was this power grab. The teaching was introduced in a very clumsy way, as I recall. So you had this announcement at the October 6th, 2012 annual meeting in front of a combined audience of, I think, around 15,000 elite Jehovah's Witnesses. But they had to wait until the teaching was actually put in a watchtower. So they had to wait and wait for this watchtower to be printed. And I remember there was also a leak. So the, the watchtower containing a detailed description of this new light was leaked 
ahead of its official release to the congregations. So it was a very, very ham-fisted, clumsy way of disseminating this huge change in Jehovah's Witness doctrine. But here's where it gets summed up in the 2013 Watchtower, July 15th, page 22. Who then is the faithful and discreet slave in keeping with Jesus' pattern of feeding many through the hands of a few? That slave is made up of a small group of anointed brothers who are directly involved in preparing and dispensing spiritual food during Christ's presence. Throughout the last days, the anointed brothers who make up the faithful slave have served together at headquarters. In recent decades, that slave has been closely identified with the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. And you might be wondering, Lloyd, why is this so high on the list? You know, surely the beards thing, surely the preaching reporting thing, surely they should be higher. I think this is much higher than those things because what this teaching did back in 2012 was give the governing body the power that they are wielding today. And I think that the changes that we're seeing and the language that's being used about the governing body and how they should be obeyed, all of that really stems from this change. Because even though the governing body were a huge deal, even before 2012, everybody looked up to the governing body as being the ones who were in practicality producing the spiritual food. At least in theory, the power was shared with thousands of anointed ones. It was supposed to be more of a communal thing. It was supposed to be a little, a little bit less autocratic. <laughs> And then in 2012, the governing body assumes this mantle of essentially ultimate power to decide how Jehovah's Witnesses should be living their lives. No need to think about who the anointed are anymore. And haven't they been wielding that power since 2012? So that's why it's so high up on my list. But item number one, the biggest change for me in the 21st century so far, again, we're not even a quarter of a way through the 21st century as of making this video, but the biggest change that Jehovah's Witnesses have had in the 21st century so far is without a doubt JW Broadcasting. That's number one on my list. It's hard to overstate what a huge change JW Broadcasting has made in the lives of Jehovah's Witnesses and particularly the way they view the governing body. It's been monumental in bringing the governing body to the fore and putting faces on them and making Jehovah's Witnesses realize who's in charge. And just let's take a trip down memory lane. This was the very first JW Broadcasting episode. We warmly welcome you, dear brothers and sisters, for our first JW Broadcasting monthly program. Here are some of the highlights you can look forward to. You will hear the exciting story of a brother who found the truth at the age of 87. So October 2014, that was the very first JW Broadcasting episode. I remember it vividly. And the delicious irony in all of this is that ultimately, JW Broadcasting is self-defeating for the governing body. It's a vanity project. You can understand why cult leaders would want more prominence. You can understand why they would want to be in people's faces and for everybody to know who they are and what they look like. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to help them. Because when I was a Jehovah's Witness, 
it was immensely helpful to not know what they looked like because they were more mysterious. It was, ooh, the governing body. I remember visiting in 2002, 2003. I can remember visiting on multiple times uh, the headquarters in Brooklyn. And on one of those visits... I was introduced to a governing body member. So the the tour guide just said, oh, this brother is um, so-and-so. He's a member of the governing body. I can't be 100% sure, but I think it was Garrett Lush. So I get introduced to Garrett Lush on a tour of Brooklyn. But the point is, I wouldn't have known who it was. We prided ourselves on the fact that Th these governing body members could mingle among us and we wouldn't really know who they were. There was, They were mysterious and that made them special. And quite frankly, in the JW Broadcasting era, the governing body, well, well, they're special in a way, but not in the right way, if you know what I mean. They've got the prominence they crave using this new tool, wielding this new weapon, of information warfare, you know, using it to just inundate Jehovah's Witnesses globally with this torrent of propaganda, all extremely manipulative and all aimed at enforcing their control. But we can now see them warts and all, and we can see them to be incredibly flawed incredibly vain, incredibly manipulative men who deserve no respect. That's why the JW Broadcasting is top of my list, because the Jehovah's Witness religion changed overnight, in my opinion, when that first Stephen Lett JW Broadcasting went up. Not just the actual episodes themselves, but the focus on video making, you'd already had, I guess you could argue, in 2012, the Caleb and Sophia videos, they predate JW Broadcasting. And there were videos, you know, there were occasional propaganda videos put out by the organization, perhaps on, a, on an annual or every year or so basis. But when those cameras first rolled, or, or when that guy who you see at the side first goes like that, that was kind of the starting gun for an unprecedented torrent of highly manipulative video propaganda that was night and day, almost, from my experience of being one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Everything was way more dignified, you know, the religion itself. At least as I recall, there was way more emphasis on reading and on studying. The whole organization had a more scholarly feel to it when I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Now it's televangelism. It's all the razzmatazz, it's the lights, the lights camera action, and it's, you know, making things look nice, irrespective of what's actually being said. That it, It's so obviously superficial and manufactured, the religion nowadays in the JW Broadcasting era. So hopefully you can understand why JW Broadcasting makes it to the top of my list. It was a game changer. Although, I could be wrong. You know, there's freedom to disagree. If you think there are changes that I've missed, or if you disagree with the ordering, let me know in the comments. I would love to get your opinion. And before I close, I really must thank my patrons and YouTube channel members who voted for this video. How it works is YouTube channel members and patrons get a monthly vote where they get choices of which topic they want me to talk about in a future video. And this was one of the ones they voted for recently. So I think it's a very good choice. It's a very good topic. 
and hopefully by going through these changes, all of which have happened in the 21st century, it's again helped us to understand how this religion is in just such a state of flux and how the changes are so arbitrary and so obviously human. There is no Holy Spirit involved in any of this, is there? So I hope you found this helpful. Don't forget that you can watch similar videos by subscribing to the Lloyd Evans channel. But that's all I have time for. Thank you so much for watching. I'm